Hey everybody, welcome to Advanced Feature Flagging. It's all about the data. Uh, I'm Dave Caro. Uh, I'm going to go through this slide presentation pretty quickly. So uh, we'll do these three sections. We'll review feature flags to make sure we all kind of understand what they are and how they're used. And then the meat of why this session is important, which is about the data, right? How do we make sense of the data? And, and we'll kind of look both to get sharpen our tools about um, why how you measure matters and you shouldn't believe everything you see in data. And then we'll talk about how to put the flags and the data together to get something that's really an experimentation platform. So first of all, just to recap on feature flags, right? Many of you already are using feature flags and you know they're a tool that empowers your org to separate code deploy from feature release. For those who aren't familiar, a feature flag is a simple if else statement. It's usually powered by a configuration or a service or an external tool. And it can be modified to target the code that it wraps around without doing a new deployment, right? And you can do that to specifically target subsets of your population. Usually they're targeted at users, but they can modify anything based on session or service or request, um, anything that's applicable to the code change you're doing. Typical types would be a simple switch that just turns a feature on and off that can be used to ramp up to a randomized population. And they can also be used to do a multivariate experiments where you're trying several, several variations of something like different uh, backend search algorithms. Let's look at, at phases of a rollout, right? So at the beginning, deploy doesn't cause any exposure to users, right? So first we deploy, the feature flag is turned off, nobody's getting the feature. Then we gradually ramp up. And at the beginning, we might actually ramp up only to employees. And certainly before that, we would have allowed access to the dev developer, the dev and the test team. Um, but we might then do some dog fooding with employees and then start rolling out to our customers, uh, maybe with as little as 1% or 2% or a little bit more. And our goal there is error mitigation. We're trying to find bugs. We're trying to find problems we didn't already find in testing by doing testing in prod. And we're even doing a little bit of that with actual customers because no matter how much testing in prod we do, we're probably going to miss something that a real user is going to run into. And we want to run into that early, right, before we get to a lot of users. And then we're going to uh, ramp up. And understanding the effect of your change requires lots of data. So if you really want to prove whether a change you've made in your code is making a difference in how users behave, the more data you can get, the better. And that's called maximum power ramp, basically a 50-50 split. Uh, then we're going to ramp up and we might pause along the way to do a scale mitigation. We might get to 60, 70, 80 percent and hold for a while and wait through a peak traffic period to make sure that we can handle scale as well as that we don't have bugs and that we're making the, the user behavior change the way we were hoping. And then we're released, then we're out. So let's get into the meat of the talk, which is how you measure matters. I want to focus on um, this because it's it's a stumbling point for a lot of people that, that are used to using sort of traditional charts and graphs, and then you get into a, a gradual rollout world, and a lot of this breaks down, right? Your, your metrics don't really work the same way when you're going out to 5% of your population. Here's a systems dashboard from our own product. Uh, we were rolling out some changes, and suddenly we saw these huge spikes, and, and we spent a lot of time on triaging, you know, what have we changed, and why is this happening, what's going on? And we'll come back to this in a minute, but suffice to say that things weren't quite as they appeared. Let's look at a more typical situation. Here you see that when a feature was taken to 100%, there was a huge spike up in something and spike down in something else. It's probably latency and, and throughput, right? And that's obvious to see. We, for one of the first things we did at Split was to overlay feature flag changes onto our graphs. And you can see when it's 100%, yeah, we know kind of can figure out what happened here. But think about that. The 5%, we rolled out to 5% first, and you could not see the differences in the graphs. There's, there's just no meaningful difference versus the noise before them, right? And that's why when you're doing these gradual rollouts, you can miss really useful, important data if you're not looking through the right kind of lens. Right? So I'm going to briefly cover this one, which is that correlation is not causation. Ice cream sales and shark attacks both peak in the summer, but they're not related to each other. They don't cause each other, right? We'll come back to that. So turns out that that dashboard I showed you, that wasn't a feature change. It was a customer of ours that was undergoing a distributed denial of service attack. And so we wasted a ton of time trying to figure out what was going on, what was wrong with our system or our code. Turns out nothing was, right? It would have been nice to have a little clearer information about what was going on. So let's get back to, so, so just looking at the dashboard is not going to be enough, right? And especially because of this, when there's other things happening in the world, whether there's changes in your product, whether the marketing is doing something, a global pandemic like what we're having now, or just nice weather, right? It can change what happens. And so the issue is we don't want to just be visually looking at graphs or even just dealing with arbitrary threshold alerts. We want a smarter way to look at it. And science gives us a smarter way to look at it, which is the idea of a randomized controlled trial, 
right? If you randomize a population across a treatment and a control, uh, and then watch the differences between them, you're, you're, you're accounting, since you're randomly picking people, you'll have people that are East Coast and people that are West Coast, people that are young, people that are old, whatever. Anything else that could cause variation, you're equally distributing. And so this lets you to, to distribute the effects of outside factors between the two samples evenly so that the things that are different are actually what you're measuring. So when you do this, the first thing you do is you have this kind of body of events that are happening and you need to do attribution. You need to assign them to the different cohorts, the people who had it, the people who didn't have it, that kind of thing, right? And when you do, you're going to start seeing some, you may see some patterns emerge, right? So our goal is to actually end up with a distribution of data, right? And, and we can see here, kind of, I'll jump to the next slide, is that these distributions are actually offset, which is meaningful. So if they were mostly overlapped, it's probably no difference. But the fact that these distributions are offset, the statistical analysis is telling us that there's a really a difference. Um, and stats is kind of weird. It's backwards. Um, stat tests basically seek to disprove that nothing happened. So the first thing they want to say is that, well, it, likely you didn't accomplish anything. Um, let's prove otherwise. And so when you, when you, when you pass a test, what you've said is that, is that it's, it's more significant than if it had been random, right? And we can talk about that later if you really want to go deep in the stats geekery. So a lot of teams and modern apps, you know, uh, there are many ways to, to achieve this comparative analysis, right? And most, most modern teams have a lot of telemetry coming in from their, from their systems. They've got a lot of data and uh, dashboarding tools have the ability to tag, right? So, so you can um, tag data from different uh, uh releases as they're passing through different experiences that are happening and you can segment that way and it's powerful it's useful uh, some teams have more than that they've got sort of their in-house uh, analysis kind of warehouse or uh, uh, bi system and if you can pull data into that you can do ad hoc queries and you can do some pretty sophisticated stuff the issue there is that both of these are kind of ad hoc and they're not very statistically rigorous right which is why more and more teams are moving towards an experimentation platform if you look at what LinkedIn and Facebook and all those guys have been doing forever, they, they introduced the ability of experimentation platforms to make this process more reliable and meaningful for them, right? So that's where we get to here in the third section of the talk, which is if you take flags, feature flags that are controlling who gets what, and you take the right kind of data and you parse it in, in intelligent ways, you effectively end up with an experimentation platform, whether you call it that or not, right? And I just want to share some components and some kind of uh, guidelines here, because you may want to, to assemble what you already have to this, or you may want to sort of search out for what can you bolt in that'll do this. And so let's talk about the pieces. First one is targeting. And we talked about feature flags earlier. So targeting powers of feature flags and kind of re records who got what. So not just assigning people to a thing, but also keeping track of who got what, right? And then um, uh, telemetry is about bringing in data, whether it's data that you're instrumenting uh, explicitly or whether it's data you're already capturing that you can just ca uh, gather, right? So this is called engine is the thing that's going to make sense of the data and a management console is what's going to make it accessible to anybody who needs to get to it as opposed to it being, you know, buried in a database somewhere, right? So targeting, the thing about targeting is you need this to be fast. It cannot be in the way of the user experience. So it has to be something that happens um, super fast is not a bottleneck. You have to be able to randomize because if you want to do a controlled study, you basically need to take whatever population you're choosing and be able to randomly distribute the incoming people into two or more cohorts. And so it needs to be able to do randomization, but it also needs to be sticky. This is a paradox. You want to randomly put people in experiences, but you want the same people to end up in the same experience if they pass through the code more than once. Right. And so you don't want me to log in today and get a blue screen and tomorrow to get a green screen and say, what's happening here? Right. So um, it needs to be randomized and sticky. And then, of course, it needs to be reliable. It can never go down. It can never be that can never cause um, a, a single point of failure. Right? And so a lot of people that put work in this, you'll see they do a lot of clever things to make sure that it's never in the way and it's never slowing it down. So let's just briefly talk about some of you are asking probably asking, how can a system be both random and sticky, right? And this is done through hashing. Basically, you take an arbitrary piece of data like the user ID or some unique key for the user, and you run it through a hashing algorithm with a seed, right? And the same data going in will come out as the same hash value each time, provided to give it the same seed. So you want to use a different seed for each feature, but each time a feature is presented, you, you go through the same hash. And so a person's going to get put into the same hash value, and you normalize that, um, hashes are really great now in that they're evenly distributed people through the output. And so you can then normalize that to a number between 0 and 99, 
bingo, you've got a bucket that's consistent no matter how many times a person comes through. So you end up with people being assigned an arbitrary bucket number from zero to 99. And here we have this population. And as we ramp up and down in percentage, we're going to bring people in and out of the, of the experiment, right? Now, for telemetry, any modern software already has some amount of telemetry in place, right? And it could be stored internally in the app. It could be sent to a business intelligence tool, or maybe it's automatically collected by another product. Collecting that is typically as simple as just building a wrapper around your existing tracking and sending um, a copy of those events to the platform, right? To the experimentation platform, in, ad in addition to whatever destinations it's going to, right? And if you've already got an internal analytics warehouse, you might even be able to skip that step because you can just extract from that warehouse directly if the data is already getting in there, right? So it's really important, though, that the telemetry data includes a unique key for the user, the same thing that was used to assign them an experience, right? Because that's how you're going to do the attribution and tie the data to the features. For the stats engine, we get back to this notion of attribution, calculation, and analysis. And in the attribution process, the assignment data is combined with telemetry. So who got what is combined with and then what happened, right? And that's how you're getting these colored dots, right? And, and figuring out what this distribution is. And then you're going to go on to the distribution, calculating distribution, and that's creating these curves. And then finally, comparing those curves with a statistical test. And most commonly, the statistical test it's using is called a t-test, and it, and it will return a probability or a p-value whether the two samples are the result of the same underlying behavior. So in stats, it's kind of backwards. Like I said, you're sort of disproving that nothing happened, um, which is the same thing as proving something did happen. So if the probability that what happened couldn't come from being random, then you can say we have proof that it, that it happened, right? Um, and again, this gets back, this only really works if you're accurately randomly assigning people to the different experiences, right? And then finally, management console. And you might wonder why I've added this to the list. And the thing is that this is where your team can manage the rollouts and review the metric results. And the thing is that most people's first feature flagging tool is powered by like a static configuration file or an entry in a database or, or sort of a headless service. And the problem is that approach limits who has access to a rollout and who can, you know, and, and requires a lot of technical knowledge to be able to tell what's really happening, right? So you want to build some kind of a front end that people can get at that provides a, a consistent way to get at things. And you obviously can use access management control who can get to what and do with things. But simplifying that approach so it's not a wizard uh, making SQL queries or, or something like that will uh, increase adoption and the credibility of the results because more people will see it and trust it. Just want to quickly show you uh, some examples. So Walmart has something called Expo, and they um, have a fancy UI so they can actually make sense of it without having to be in the database. They have practices they have like test to learn and test to launch. You can learn more about that in a, in a blog post I put up recently on our site. Um, and they have some pretty far, powerful data uh, manipulation pipeline to get data quickly move from one place to another. Uh, LinkedIn has something called LinkedIn Experimentation or Lix. Um, and you can learn a lot more about that online. One nice thing they're doing here is you can see that they um, have alerts they're firing. And if you look at Accelerate, the book recommends that monitoring isn't something you should do ad hoc. It's something that should be proactive, right? And so this alert would fire if one side of an experiment has a markedly different site speed. And here's an example from Booking.com. Another place you can learn more about online. They have some great blog posts on this, a couple of videos as well. And there, the, the top left is another one of these alerts. This is firing. They can literally detect an issue that's glaringly wrong and shut off a new feature within one second of it going live. So the mean time to detect and mean time to resolve is inside of one second. Pretty crazy, pretty amazing. You don't really have to shoot for that. You can avoid a war room if you can get it down to like five minutes probably, right? The bottom one is actually a, an error that's firing saying that the data coming in doesn't make sense. You've probably instrumented wrong or you've got a bug in how you've coded this because the data coming in doesn't fit the distribution you're shooting for. And then there's a graphic there from one of the recent blog posts. And the last thing I wanted to show you before we kind of go into our discussion is uh, there's a book out that's finally out now. It's been a couple of years in the process called Trustworthy Online Controlled Experiments. And this was created by uh, Ron Kohavi, Diane Tang, and Yazoo. Ron worked at Amazon and Microsoft on some very sophisticated experimentation. Diane is from Google and Yazoo is at LinkedIn. And these people have the lessons learned and they've written not a textbook, but they've written a it's kind of a recipe book and a and a Imagine you're having beers with people who've been there before and they're kind of sharing what you need to know. It's very readable, um, very well organized. So highly recommended. And you can get the first chapter for free at that URL, experimentationguide.com. This is all you'll see about my company in this presentation today, which is it's split. 
big surprise, makes an off-the-shelf experimentation platform for engineering teams for releasing software, right? Not so much geared towards marketing, but more geared towards how do we build software and release it quickly and limit the blast radius and be able to uh, determine what has an impact and be able to make every rollout some kind of an experiment so we can see how well we're doing and we can adjust our trajectory, right? So if you want to learn more about Split, uh, we have a great blog. Uh, fully two-thirds of our content has nothing to do with Split. It's about what's going on in the industry and we, what you can learn here. And uh, happy to point you to some stuff during our Q&A on that. So thank you very much. I know that was really fast, but my goal was to give you uh, kind of expand your thinking about what it means to use feature flags with data and to kind of set the bar, frankly, a little bit high for you so that you know what's possible because there's teams that are doing this all day long out there and you don't have to leave this to the sort of giant unicorns as a practice that, that only they have. We can all do this if we just kind of know which boxes to check off, right? Cool. Thanks for following along.